All right, so hi, and welcome to the Engineers HVAC podcast, where we work to give back to the HVAC community by sharing our HVAC application and design experience. I'm Tony Mormino, your host for this episode titled Psychometrics Part 2, SHR Calculating CFM and Tons of Refrigeration. So that's what we're going to be going over with, with you all this morning. So um, the Engineers HVAC podcast is brought to you by Insight Partners and Hobbs and & Associates, two commercial HVAC rep firms committed to educating and empowering the HVAC community. This podcast does qualify for PDH credits in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Virginia, Tennessee, Maryland, Alabama, and many other states. So please email me and I'll provide you the certificate. And please check with your state just to make sure. But the states I've listed, we know that it's good to go there. And Heather could put up our email, my email address here at any time. So, and if you're listening to this in the future to a recorded version of this on our podcast, you can watch the full video version on our YouTube channel at HVAC-TV. So just go to YouTube, type in at HVAC-TV, and it'll pop up and you can watch the video version. I think you will get something out of the audio version as well, but we will be referencing a lot of charts and stuff like that here too. So it might be helpful to watch. Watch them both. So if you'd like to follow along today, you can download a PDF of the Insight Partners or Hobbs psychometric chart at insightusa.com slash psych charts. And again, if you're watching or listening to this in the future, go to the video or audio description and the link will be there to download your psych chart and you can kind of follow along. So again, running the show behind the scenes is our trusted producer, Heather Robinson, brand manager with Insight Partners. How are you this morning, Heather? I'm doing great. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to for part two. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I hope it goes well. No, thanks for being here, Heather. We appreciate you. And thank you all um, so much for watching. And one of the reasons we do these live is because we really love the engagement. So I love to have questions. Uh, hopefully I can answer most of them, but feel free to ask questions in the chat and I'll either get to them as we roll through this or I'll just, you know, at the end, I'll definitely get to all of them, but I'll try to answer some of them as we go along as well. So, okay, so let's get this thing rolling. So, you know, again, psychometrics part two, uh, SHR calculating CFM and tons of, of refrigeration. So, you know, a lot of times when we do these, these things, they're not the, you know, most glamorous or exciting presentations to, to listen to. And the fundamental, you know, res responses, you know, this is pretty boring. I totally get it, but I can tell you from my experience, Having a fundamental now fundamental knowledge of psychometrics has helped me tremendously in my career. I started in '97, and I started out with a company that really paid a lot of attention to um, and gave a lot of value to understanding psychometrics. If it's and it's helped me in terms of you know getting the design, helping engineers getting the design right in the first place, and also you know if you have issues, it's a great troubleshooting tool. And one of the main reasons, and I'm going to really stress this at the end here, is understanding what happens to equipment at part load. So I would say one of the major issues we see in this industry is, is folks not 100% understanding how units function at part load, which is where we spend 90% of our time and where we can get into a lot of trouble if we don't, we don't understand it. Okay, so that's my preach about psychometrics. So from part one, again, if you haven't seen this one, you could see it on our YouTube channel anytime. We talked about the properties of air. We talked about how to build the psychometric chart. We looked at psychometric processes of moving around the chart, heating, cooling, dehumidification, humidification, et cetera. And then we looked at determining air properties from, from the chart. So the next logical production, per, um, progression, that's what I'm looking for, is to do what we're doing today, which is to talk about air mixing. We're going to talk about the sensible heat ratio. Again, extremely important when you're talking about part load is to understand that. We're going to look at calculating air quantity or calculating CFM, and then we're going to look at calculating tons. So those are the basic four parts of this presentation. And then at the end, I'll give you a little teaser to part three, which is really trying to, you know, stress again the importance of understanding uh, part load conditions. So air mixing. So let's start with part one, which is air mixing. So we're talking about calculating the air properties of two mixed air streams, which is a very fundamental, you know, way to use the the psychometric chart. So you have what you're seeing here is just a general basic air conditioning system. You've got a cold coil, a cooling coil. Let's say it's a chill water coil, a supply fan. You've got 25% outdoor air. Turn my, my pen on here, 25% outdoor air, and then 75% 
is return air. The outdoor air is at 95.78, which is a good, nice southeast, you know, balmy design day. And the return air, for sakes of this example, is 72 degrees and 50%. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the mixed air temperature, which would be right here before it goes into the cooling coil. If you're going to select HVAC equipment, it's good to know what that what that temperature is, right? Okay. So what we're going to use is something called the mixed air temperature equation. Fix my slide here. Got a little issue. Okay. Mixed air temperature equation, which is goes like this. The OA temp times the percent of OA plus the return air temp times the percent of return air. So if we go back to what we know before, it's 25% OA and 75% return air. So if we go ahead and fill in that equation, 95 degrees times 25%, which is right here, 72 degrees times 0.75%, equals roughly 77.8 degrees. So that's the dry bulb of the mixed air temperature. Okay, so how do we get the wet bulb? Okay, how do we get the wet bulb of this mixed air temperature and find the other conditions of this mixed air um, scenario? So what we do is we go to the psychometric chart and we're going to plot the outside air, which is at 95.78. Okay, so how do we plot this temperature? Well, what we do is we go and find the dry bulb on the bottom. I know you all know this because you've watched part one over like five times, right? So you plot the 95 degrees on the bottom, which is right here, dry bulb. You draw a line straight up to 78 degrees wet bulb, which would be, let's see, this is 75, 76, 77, 78-ish is something like right around there. And then we fill that in, and that is our outside air condition of 95.78, okay? So now we're going to plot the return air conditions, which is at 72 degrees. And then, you know, it's down here somewhere, 72-ish degrees. We're going to draw the line up to 72 degrees, and then we're going to hit the relative humidity curve, which is right here. Relative humidity is curves that run kind of in this direction. And we're going to plot that there. Okay, so now you have your plotted conditions of your outside air and return air. Okay, so what happens is when you have two air streams coming together, the mixed air temperature, the mixed air conditions will always lie on a line that connects the two on the psychometric chart. Okay, so again, if we have a mixed air temperature of 77.8, we connect these two dots, we fill in, we locate the 77.8 right here. Okay, we bring it up to this point here and we go ahead and make a point there. Okay, so that's our mixed air temperature because we calculated it before using the mixed air temperature. Now, how do we get the wet bulb of this condition? Well, we just follow the wet bulb line up to this area here, like the closest line that intersects this point, which it looks like is right here. We draw it in like that. Okay, so that's how we get the wet bulb, which is 65 degrees wet. Now we can get dry bulb, we can get the humidity, we can get all the other, you know, properties of this air point as well by doing the same kind of thing on the psych chart. But okay, so right now we just want the wet bulb. Okay. So now you can see we have our 25% outdoor air at 95.78, mixing with our return air at 72, 50%, which gives us roughly 78.65, okay? So that would be the condition of the air entering the coil, all right? So I hope that makes sense. Do, 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 do. Okay, going on to the next section here. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is sensible heat ratio. And again, this is like, I, one of the fundamental problems we see in HVAC is, is folks not understanding what happens at part load condition. Like designing for full load is pretty easy. Designing for part load is where we get into a lot of trouble. And you could understand what happens at part load by understanding the sensible heat ratio and how that, how that changes. Okay, so, so the sensible heat ratio describes the ratio of sensible heat load to the total heat load. All right, so to understand sensible heat ratio, you really have to understand the difference between sensible 
and latent heat. So I've got some examples here I'm going to go through to explain the differences. So when I when I think of sensible heat, I think of temperature only, okay? It doesn't matter how much moisture. It's not looking at the moisture content of the air. It's only the heat. So if you look at this drawing here, you've got some sensible heat coming off of this fire through what's called convection. The heat heats the air. The air heats your hands, okay? You've got air. You've got um, this rod this guy's holding. Heat travels through the rod through conduction, okay? And heat always moves from a higher source to a lower source. And I've always been taught there's no such thing as cold. It's just different levels of heat, right? So, so cooler temperatures are just lower levels of heat than higher temperatures. Then you have radiant heat or radiation. A good example of that is you go outside, it's 50 degrees, but you feel the warmth of the sun and that's through the radiant heat. So radiant heat has to do with electromagnetic waves and, and has to hit some kind of mass to provide some some heat, and we'll look at some examples of these three. So basically, sensible heat is heat independent of, of moisture. Okay, so what in the build in buildings do we have that produce sensible heat? Well, we have a lot of things, right? Um, I think anything you plug in produces sensible heat. Chat me if you're if you if you got an example of something that doesn't, but it's a good example of that would be like computers. People generate a lot of heat. People do generate sensible and latent. Um, just for reference, 500 BTUs is the is the is the average for kind of moderate work um, of a human producing BTU. So half of that would be sensible, half of that would be latent. Obviously, if you're designing a gym, it's going to be more than 500 BTUs per person. But that's another sensible heat source. Copiers produce sensible heat. Uh, printers produce sensible heat. Again, anything plugged in, and the sun. I got a picture of the sun there because that's the main contributor to heat of a building is when the sun's shining down on the building. Got this little example. So I went around with my little uh, temperature meter here and took some temperatures of some surfaces. You can see this is one of the, this light is actually right in front of me right now. It's one of a couple lights in this room. So this room's got tons of lighting for, you know, we do these shows and you can see it's 120-ish degrees for that light. So that would be sensible heat. It's not adding any moisture to the space. It's sensible heat only. I had a lot of fun going around the building, by the way. This was cool. So so just went around. There's another light bulb. This is in our lounge. You can see that one's at about 95-ish degrees. Not as much wattage as the one that's in front of me. And then I have an LED light. I think that's an LED light. I think these are all LED lights. This one is very mild. You know, you can barely see some heat coming off of it. But it is adding sensible heat to the space because the space is, like right now, it's only, I think, 70 degrees in here or something like that. So. Yeah, 72-ish degrees. It was the same the other day. So there's that. Um, we talked about computers. So you can see the computer getting zapped here. You know, the keyboard, 94 degrees, producing sensible heat. Um, okay, so we're gonna look at we're gonna look at a little example here of I have of convection and just another sensible heat example. Let's see here. Why don't I make this screen bigger, which I will do by hitting this button here, I believe. Do, 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 do. There we go. Okay, so here's an example of convection heat, sensible heat through convection. So this is a little, you know, 250 watt unit heater. And here's a very fancy schmancy, easy read thermometer. And you could see the temperature is about 70, 75-ish degrees. And this is going to heat up as we move, you know, got this heater blowing on this. So this is an example of sensible heat, right? Whenever you see a thermometer, a dry bulb thermometer, and it's increasing in temperature, that is a sensible heat situation. So it's not putting any moisture into the air. I just clicked it off by the safety, but you'll see it just heat. Okay, so it's already up to 80 degrees. So it started out at 72-ish, 75, and it's heating up. So a good example of sensible heat only into the space, right? No moisture being produced by this thing. At least, I hope not. So go back to... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, so we talked about that. I'm going to actually minimize this screen here and do something like this. And do something like this. Okay, so any more examples here? Let's do some more examples of do, 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 sensible heat. Okay, here's another unit heater. 
this is really the same thing as what I just did. So I'll just kind of fast forward through this one. Um, so you can see the heat coming out of here went from 70 to 87. So again, sensible only heat. Another example of that. This is a pretty good example of, you know, radiant heat. So you can see there's a window here with the sun shining through and see this red door. It's on the inside of the building and the temperature on the inside, at least in this kind of entryway area is about 77.5 degrees. The sun is hitting this door, which is really cool. It's about 200 years old or about 100 years old, sorry. And it's about 90 degrees, right? So you can see the temperature in the space is about 77-ish, but the temperature of that surface because of the radiant heat from the sun is about 89 degrees. So that's just an example of, of radiant heat. And one more, I think, example of radiant heat. This is the rooftop of this building. I think this was yesterday. It was 72 degrees outside. And the deck on the top is 110-ish. And then I believe I shoot over to the membrane of the roof, which is not, you know, it's lighter in color, so it's not uh, gonna be as hot as 92 degrees. So other examples of radiant heat there. All right, so that is sensible heat. So that's pretty easy to understand. Latent heat, I think is a little bit more challenging. So latent heat has to do with the amount of energy needed to cause a phase change in, in you know, in our purposes from a liquid to a gas or from a gas to a liquid, right? So we're talking about vaporization of a liquid or condensation of a gas to a liquid. So think about latent heat as the, the moisture energy in the air. That's kind of the way I like to think about it. And what in commercial buildings or in our homes or in any space you would air condition, what adds latent heat to the space? Well, anything that has water coming out of it can add latent heat to the space, right? So sinks, obviously, you had a shower or whatever in a gym that's gonna add latent heat. Um, this is to represent a water feature. If you have a you know, fountain in your building or even a pool, that's going to add tons of latent heat. Don't put a pool in your building, by the way. Not a good idea. Keep it separate, detached from your building. Okay. If you have plants in your building, that's going to make heat, uh, latent heat. Um, people are going to make latent heat as well. Okay. And then, you know, if you have coffee or hot liquid in your building, that's going to make latent heat also. So speaking of coffee, my next example I'm getting really um, pushing my luck with this <laughs> separate camera, moving this hot cup of coffee around live on LinkedIn. So anyway, I hope you can see this. Let me uh, let me move it over like right here. Okay, so anyway, so this is a cup of coffee. Inside there's coffee. And this is gonna be my example of latent heat. So from a sensible heat standpoint, you can see that if you hit the outside of this, it's about 136 degrees, right? And if you took the coffee cup off of here and just looked at the hot plate, it's pretty hot. So I love this thing, keeps my coffee nice and hot. I like, I like my coffee hot. And that is two examples of sensible heat. So sensible heat coming off the coffee mug, sensible heat coming off here. Now, if we wanna see an example of latent heat, we could take this humidity monitor, which is at 60 degree dew point, so dew point's an excellent indicator of the amount of moisture in the air. And if we're adding latent heat, we should be increasing the dew point of the air. So I'm gonna turn this upside down because it's a good way to get a reading here. It's gonna be a little hard to read, but you can see it's going from 62, 63, 65, 68, et cetera. So that's an example of adding latent heat to the space, right? So you're adding moisture to the space. You're adding sensible heat from the burner, from the outside of the cup, you're adding sensible heat and latent heat from the inside, which I can promise you is coffee there. Okay, that was real risky. All right, so you can see we're at about how quickly that shot up. So 85 degree dew point from, what were we at? 60 something? I don't know, I can't remember. So anyway, so we've increased the dew point. So that is an example of latent heat to the space. So anything in the space that would be doing that, people do that, animals do that, et cetera, add latent heat to the space. Okay. So we got through that without spilling coffee on myself, which was my goal. So yay for that. Okay, so other examples of latent heat. 
Uh, this is just another example of the coffee pot in my, you know, out in my vestibule here um, in her office. So you can see it goes from 60 to 61 to 77. I'm going to speed it up here because really this is just a bigger version of the, what we just did, right? So um, again, latent heat and that coffee maker is also adding sensible heat to the space. Okay, so what else puts latent heat into the space, right? We talked about people, things in the space that put off water, water fountains, water features, um, animals or whatever, but a big, a big, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Component of latent heat in the space is, you know, we have to bring outside air in for ventilation, right? And if you're not treating that makeup air properly, if you're not dehumidifying it properly or you're inadequately, you know, leaving the coil at 65 degrees when you should be leaving at 50, et cetera, these, can all, these processes can add latent heat to the space and a lot of latent heat. Uh, the other way we could add latent heat to the space is from infiltration, right? Old, you know, buildings leak, you know, you might have uh, windows that aren't sealed properly, et cetera. So you can get latent heat into your building um, as well that way. Uh, this is just another, I, I just like this video because <laughs> it's that same unit. This is a 50 ton um, makeup air unit. There's two uh, condensate drains off of this particular unit. You can just see how much, it's amazing how much condensate. And this was a pretty dry day when we were out there uh, on site not too long ago. So it's amazing. Like a 50,000 square foot building could add one to 10 gallons, um, can yield one to 10 gallons per minute of condensate during peak cooling times. And over a year that could add up to like 150 to 200,000 gallons of water savings. Really doesn't have a lot to do with this presentation other than, you know, showing you uh, how much moisture can come out of an outdoor airstream. So, oops, I went a little fast there. So a couple more examples to look at so we can make sure we drive home the difference between sensible and latent heat. So if you look at this drawing here, just look at it for a second and think what is providing sensible heat to this space, right? You know, the immediate thing is the sun, you know, coming through the windows there, that's sensible heat. Um, you could have uh, the surface temperature of the inside wall is hot because it's conducting heat from the outside wall. Um, if the radiator was on, you would have a radiator putting sensible heat into the space. And the other obvious thing would be this cat here who looks pretty comfortable. It's putting sensible heat into the space and putting latent heat into the space, okay? Because most living things are gonna, gonna add latent heat to the space. If the windows had a crack in it and it was out, hot and muggy outside, you would get infiltration that way through latent heat. If you look at this, you know, this is a really jam-packed studio here. You've got all these people adding latent and sensible heat. You've got some empty, some open water bottles adding latent heat. You've got televisions, lights, cameras, all this kind of stuff. So that's just another, you know, way to kind of illustrate the sensible versus latent, latent heat. Okay, so we're almost done with the, with the SHR uh, portion. So sensible and latent heat is, express, is expressed in BTUs. A BTU is short for a British thermal unit. And it's the amount of heat needed to raise one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. So that is where a BTU comes from. So it's a unit of energy. Okay, so if we go to the psych chart and we look at, you know, the, the purpose of an AC, HVAC system is to remove sensible and late heat in the, in the air conditioning system when you're in the cooling mode. So, you know, what does it look like to remove sensible heat? Well, whenever you're moving from right to left on the psychometric chart, that is a reduction in sensible heat. And whenever you're going down, downward motion in the psych chart, you're removing latent heat, right? Because the dew point, as you look at, if you were to look at the psych chart closely, you know that the dew point here is 85-ish and the dew point here is 30, right? So as you go up, you're increasing in moisture or humidity. And as you go down, you're decreasing in humidity. So those are the processes of sensible and latent cooling, <clears throat> excuse me. And again, if you look at the psych chart, you'll see that as you go in this diagonal direction, it's both sensible and latent, which is what we typically do in an HVAC system, right? We're cooling the air and dehumidifying it if it's needed and if it's working and designed properly. All right, so we're still working towards calculating that SHR. So we talked about sensible heat ratio. We talked about what sensible heat is versus latent. So let's calculate an actual sensible heat ratio. Well, to calculate an SHR of a space, we need to know the building load. We need to put it into our program, whatever 
building load program, you use it as a, as a designer. It's going to tell you what the sensible and latent loads are in the space. So if you look at this space here, this would be, you know, relatively small space. You've got sensible heat coming in through the windows, coming in through the walls, the roof. You've got lighting, you've got computers, you've got people, you've probably got some outside air coming in, and those all contribute to the sensible and latent heat. So let's say you took this building and you plugged it into your favorite load program and you calculated that the sensible heat of this space was 80,000 BTUs and the latent heat was 20,000 BTUs, okay? So the total heat is 100,000 BTUs per hour. So what is the SHR? So the SHR again is the sensible heat divided by the total heat. So I know there's a lot of smart people out there who could probably do this in their head, which equals 0 0.80 SHR. So a pretty common sensible heat ratio for the space, right? So that's the ratio of sensible heat to total heat. All right, so here's how we take the sensible heat ratio and use it on the psychometric chart. So here's a psychometric chart with a ruler. We'll need a straight edge to do this properly. Okay, so the first thing we wanna do is locate what's called the index point. Now, on this chart, it's done differently on different charts. So on the particular chart, we use, excuse me, that you can download, the index point is located right here. So the way we use that is, we find the index point, and then the sensible heat ratio is located over here. So you see sensible re heat ratio equals QS, sensible heat, over QT, which is the total heat, and it's these numbers right here, okay? So we go up and find 0.7, I'm going to click this. I'm sorry, 0.8. I'm getting ahead of myself. So 0.8 SHR is right here. And we line it up with the index point. And then we draw a, a line. And there you go. Now you have drawn a sensible heat ratio line of 0.8. Now, here's where a lot of people get, get mixed up. So this, the purpose of lining it up with the index point is to get the slope. The slope of this line is what's important, not the location on the chart. So for example, if you move this line up here and maintain the same slope, the same scale, it still represents a 0.8 SHR. It still represents that ratio. If you move this down, back down here, then it still represents a 0.8 SHR, okay? So, the reason this is important to know is if you have a design room set point of 72, 50%, which is what we started out with in this example and what we're looking at here today. If you provide air anywhere on this, on this SHR at a specific quantity, a specific CFM, it'll be different at each point. You will absorb the heat and humidity in the right ratio to end up at 72.5. Okay, so if you provide air at this condition, this condition, or this condition, now the quantity of air will change depending on which of these points you use. But any of these will absorb heat and humidity in the correct ratio to get the desired conditions. That's really what's important here, okay? Okay, so we're gonna come back to that in a minute. So if you didn't quite grab that, give it, let it marinate for a minute, we're gonna come back to that. So in this slide, I'm gonna show you why that's important. So if we remove too much sensible and not enough latent, what happens to our space condition, okay? We're trying to get to 72, 50%. We're removing too much sensible and not much latent. What happens is we're gonna end up with a space which is cooler and damper, right? It's cold, but it's still more, it's still hot. It's still humid, excuse me. It's cold, but it's still humid. It's cold, but it's still hot. I don't think that's possible. Okay, so if we remove too much latent and not enough sensible, what happens to our space? It gets warmer and drier, right? So we gotta maintain that correct ratio of removing the heat and humidity from the space. And that's kind of where the SHR comes in. Okay, so we talked about air mixing. We talked about sensible heat ratio. We talked about, now next we're gonna talk about calculating air quantity. Again, if this is a lot of information, especially if you're new, I probably would be a little bit lost at this point. Um, I learned pretty slow. So if, if that's the case for you, please you know check out our YouTube channel. Uh, Heather could put up the QR code and this video will be on there. And also part one and part three is, is currently on there as well. So you can go check that out anytime. Okay. 
So we talked about air mixing. We talked about the sensible heat ratio. Now we're going to look at calculating the air quantity or calculating the CFM, right? So again, I've said this a few times. I like to think of air as a sponge, and that sponge has to absorb the sensible and latent heat in the correct ratio. So introducing the right quantity of air at the right conditions will result in the desired space condition, okay? And that goal is to do that at design and at part load too, which is really what we get into on the next on the next part three. So here's here's five steps, five easy steps, you know, to calculating um, the CFM of the space. So step one, we want to plot the mixed air temperature, the outside air temperature, and the room temperature on the psychometric chart. Okay. So if we go back to our example here, we'll see the outside air temperature is 9578. The return air is 72 degrees and 50%. And then the mixed air temperature is roughly 7865. Okay, so that's what's going into your cooling coil. And we're going to call these A, B, and C. All right? Now, and this is what they look like plotted on the chart. And I'll just go ahead and have this typed in here while I have a sip of this well-heated coffee. Okay, one more. There we go. All right, little coffee break there. Mm, that's good. Okay, so to save time, I've already plotted these out on the chart. Again, if you're watching this, pause it and go through and, you know, well, I tell you, for me, like learning psychometrics, I got to learn on the paper chart. You know, I know a lot of this is done on the computer these days. Uh, another thing that was really helpful for me when I started out, and I still do this too, is I carry around a couple of charts and in, in, I have a bag that I take to job sites. You know, it's got my, it's got my reader, it's got my basic tools, it's got a psych chart. And if you're new and if you can read temperature and humidity, you know, go through the process, read the outdoor air temperature and humidity, read the return air temperature and humidity, read the mixed air coming off the coil, going through the fan, going through the space and just plot it. And you can, and it's really just a great way to learn the process of, of, of psychometrics as you go through the chart. So anyway, that's just my two cents there. So we've got this plotted on the chart. Okay. So that's step one. Step two is to calculate the SHR. And again, these are the five steps to calculating the CFM, right? So step two is calculating the sensible heat ratio, which, which we already did and we already know is 0.8. We're going to draw the sensible heat ratio. So if you go back to our plotted points of A, B, and C, A being the return air, which is also the design condition for the space, B being the outside air, and C being the mixed air. We're going to go ahead and plot the sensible heat ratio. And again, we do that by finding 0.8 over here, which is already circled, but I'm going to circle it anyway. And then we find what? The index point which is right here. And then we do take our straight edge and we draw this out. Now, are we done? No, we're not done because we haven't moved it yet because we want the SHR to line up with our desired space condition, okay? So we're gonna take the SHR. Remember, we're just trying to get the slope by lining it up with the index point. And we're gonna move it down. So it looks like that, right? So it ends up ending up at our desired space condition of 72, 50%. So that's kind of the point of drawing the SHR. So we've got, so we've got that step done. Okay. So now we're gonna calculate the supply air conditions. This is step four. Okay. Okay, so the way we do this is point C is where we're entering the cooling coil. Okay, some psychometric charts have what's called cooling coil curves, which basically look like a series of curves, like the one I just drew here, like that. Now you can just take your straight edge and draw a straight line from here to here, which will get you there. I like to draw the curve in personally because it reminds, especially when I'm teaching this, because it reminds me of what actually happens in a cooling coil. So as the air comes into a cooling coil, it will sensibly cool to a point as it approaches the saturation line, which is this area here, it starts to condense water out of the air, latent heat, if you will, out of the air, and it comes down and meets right here. So you kind of want to draw a line from C to the final saturation point of the SHR line, okay? So I hope that makes sense. Okay. 
which is that point right there, which happens to be, for this example, about 49 degrees, okay? Which is what you would need to achieve these space conditions with this entering coil temperature. Now, a word of caution, when you arbitrarily pick 55 degrees, you can get us some trouble here because you're not gonna necessarily meet space conditions in this specific example. So this is a good, I like to point that out, to point out that don't arbitrarily pick um, 55 degrees as you're leaving air temperature, so. Okay, so there was four steps. Now here's the fifth one, calculating the supply air CFM. So in my career, you know, there's a handful of equations, which I'll call like the basic equations everybody should know on the, on the back of their hand. This is one of those equations, like the sensible heat gain equation, which can be used in so many different areas other than what we're using it for here. And the way this works is it's QS, which is sensible heat, equals 1.1, which is not a constant. We'll talk about that in a minute, times CFM, cubic feet per minute, times delta T, okay? All right, so what, what is this 1.1? And if you're, if you're older like me, it was always 1.085. As a matter of fact, it was 1.085 on this presentation until this morning because I've given it so many times and people come up to me, you know, it's 1.1 now. Okay, I get it. So now I'm, I'm getting into the new era and I've changed it to 1.1. So um, what this is, is it's basically, um, it's not a constant. It's the density times a specific heat times um, a conversion factor of 60. You know, that's how this is, a, this is calculated. And it is not, so it's at standard air conditions, which I understand is at 69 degrees and sea level, okay? So the density and specific heat of, heat of air will change depending on, depending on where you're at. So if you're, you know, where we're at here in Asheville, we're, I don't know, 1,000, 2,000 feet, depending on where you're at. It doesn't change that whole lot if you're doing commercial air conditioning. If you're doing something extremely critical, pay attention to that. If you're in Denver, you better pay attention to that because this can get you in a lot of trouble. So make sure that you know what you're dealing with wherever you're at on that. So we're looking for the CFM. So we're going to solve for CFM here, which if you arrange this equation in the right way is the sensible heat gain divided by the delta T, which in this case is the room dry bulb minus the supply dry bulb times the 1.10 in our case, okay? And you just fill that in. We know the sensible heat is 80,000. We looked at that before. And we know the temperature difference is 72 degrees, which are desired temperature, and the 49 degrees, which we got from filling in the psychometric chart and drawing the lines, right? We determined it has to be 49 degrees-ish, leaving the, the coil to achieve what we need. And if we do all that, we solve for CFM, which is 32,000 CFM. Okay. Heather, how are we doing? Are we, are we still rolling okay here? Doing good. Looks good. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> Sometimes when you're doing these live, you're like, I wonder if anybody's still listening. Okay. So I'm glad to hear people are still there. All right. So, <laughs> We're here. We're watching. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. I'm sure it's putting some people to sleep, but again, this is, you know, it's, it's kind of boring stuff, but it's super, super important to get it. I tell you, if you're new, like I can't stress enough, spend a couple hours. You really don't have to spend a lot of time to learn psychometrics. I mean, you could spend a couple hours to get the basics. And like I said, bring your chart around to the field, especially if you got a problem like, Hey, why is it humid in this space? What's the leaving air temperature of the unit? Oh, it's, it's 60 degrees. You know, why is it, you know, so anyway, so, you know, there's, there's different ways you could use it, but anyway, so now we've got our system, right? We've got the outside air temperature. Do, 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 do. Where's my pencil? Here it is. Okay. We've got the outside air. We've got the return air, CFM and conditions. We've got the mixed air and we've got a desired, you know, leaving coil, leaving the unit at 32,049 degrees. So if you're a design engineer, you would take this data, send it to your favorite HAC rep. He'd give you a selection and it may or may not be exactly to this. And you guys would go back and forth and yada, yada, yada. So that's kind of how that works. So that is the example of calculating air quantities. Okay, so just one more part here. We're going to look at tons, which is pretty short, and then I'll talk to you about the next episode. And thank you again so much for joining us. And at the end, also, um, be before we forget, uh, Heather, why don't you put up the email address to you? Make sure you email me 
If you're watching this in the in the future, you can check the description of this video and or podcast, and you can email me as well. If if that if that if you're allowed to watch um, recorded videos for PDH credits, email me and I'll send you that certificate, which I understand most people are. Um, okay, so tons of refrigeration. Okay, so a ton is twelve thousand BTUs per hour. That's another one of those. You know, if you're new, stick that in the old brain. Try to remember that. You're going to use that a lot. Um, where does this come from? So I'm always, I'm fascinated by the history of a lot of this stuff. Uh, but it, so the, here's where it comes from. So back in the ice making days, which is what we used um, refrigeration for a lot in the olden days is it takes 288,000 BTUs to melt one ton of ice. So if you wanted to melt a ton of ice in a day, um, you would chop that up and it would be 12,000 BTUs um, per hour. That's kind of how they, they, so if you're using this ice to cool things or using this ice for your AC, you know, blowing fans over it for AC or whatever, 12,000 BTUs per hour. If you had a ton of ice, uh, at specific conditions, it would, it would last you all day. That's kind of how that rolls. So, um, kind of useless information, but I like it. Okay. So here's another one of those equations. This is the total heat gain equation. And if you download our psych chart and most psych charts have, let me move this so I can see my screen. Most psych charts have this data, um, Do, 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 do. What am I doing? Okay. Most psych charts have these equations all plugged in, like right here. Try and do this backwards. Okay. Like both of our brain, our, our Hobbs and our insight charts have that in there. And most of them, most psych charts you get will have, have these equations on there. So super, super handy. Again, I, I like the printed versions cause I could sit here and, you know, play around with it and see where really, it's a really great way to understand what's going on with the, the uh, processes of cooling and heating and dehumidification. Okay. So this is another one of those equations, the total heat get equation. So, so he, he QT is what I meant to say. So the total BTUs, total heat gain equals 4.5. And that's another one of those. That's not a constant times CFM cubic feet per minute times Delta H. Hey, what's this H thing? It's new. Okay, we're going to talk about that. That's enthalpy. So that's important to know as well. So if we crack down this, break down this equation here, again, the 4.5 is not a constant. It's the density of air times six, the conversion factor of 60. Okay, so depending on where you're at, um, the 4.5 is what it would be at standard air conditions, which is sea level and 69 degrees Fahrenheit, I believe, which is used in, in a lot of places in the country. Again, if you are not at sea level, especially if you are far away from sea level, be really careful with that because um, that could get you into a lot of trouble. So that's kind of how the 4.5 is calculated or is um, determined. Okay, so the total tons of refrigeration or the total BTUs equals 4.5 times CFM times delta H. And H in this case is enthalpy. So we've all heard, we've probably heard of this if we've been in the HVAC business a while. So think of enthalpy as the total heat energy in one pound of air. Okay, it includes the sensible heat, it includes the latent heat, and it's important to know if you want to, you know, if you see this uh, picture of this cooling coal, see all the water in the drain pan. If you want to have that, you got to understand enthalpy to calculate your coil uh, sizing properly. Oh, there's a little video. I didn't know that was a video. That was a photo. There you go. Another video. So. Okay, so how do we calculate, how do we find the H of the air coming into the coil and the air leaving the coil, right? If we want to calculate the tonnage of refrigeration, we need to know those two points. So this introduces another um, part of the psychometric chart we haven't talked about yet. So enthalpy is located right here on this chart. And it's also located right here on this chart. And see these numbers here? 25, 30, 35. And if I go back here, 25, 30, 35. Okay. So the way you find out we want the coil entering enthalpy, which is right here, and we want the coil leaving enthalpy, which is right here. So we take these lines and we line them up until they intersect through these points. Now, it looks like they're the same as the wet bulb lines 
on the slant, but they're actually a little bit different. So just be careful of that. So in other words, if we want to find the enthalpy of the entering coil condition, we would line it up with, it happens to line up at 30. So we would line it up at 30 and draw the line there. So we know that is the enthalpy entering the coil, which is roughly, it's roughly 30, 29.8 to be precise. Okay, so that would be H1, H2. This is the temp, the enthalpy leaving the coil. Okay, so you got the total energy you need is the difference between the two to remove the humidity and, and temperature from that airstream, okay? So that would be H2. And there's a little picture of a cooling coil, which I'm sure you've all seen. So now we have what we need to calculate the total BTUs, okay? So the total BTUs is 4.5 times the 3200 CFM times the difference in the entering and leading, leaving coil enthalpy, which in this case is 148,320 BTUs per hour. If we take that and divide it by 12,000 BTUs per hour, we will get our tons. So basically a 12 ton system, right? So we, so we end up with, I don't know, 3,200 CFM and 12 tons and we're good to go. So that's tons of refrigeration. Okay, so just to review, we talked about air mixing. We talked about sensible heat ratio. We calculated the air quantity and the tons of refrigeration. Excuse me a second. Okay, had to cough there for a second. Okay, so the next part is really a um, lead into part three, okay? And, and I've stressed this a few times about the importance of, of part knowing that what happens at full load and at part load of HVAC systems. So I'm gonna touch on that for just a minute. And thank you all so much for joining us. And hey, if, you, if you're liking what we're doing at HVAC TV and the Energy Today Series 2 podcast, please hit that like button. We'd greatly appreciate it. Okay. So what happens at part load is extremely important, as I've mentioned probably 200 times during this presentation. Okay, so understanding part load. So on the left, you have your sunny, shiny, dry day. And on the right, you have your october -y, cool, rainy day, right? So high humidity, low temperature, okay? So full low day, our sensible heat is 80,000. Our total heat load is 100,000, which we already talked about. At part load, that changes, right? Our sensible heat is not as much because we don't have as much sunlight or we don't have as many people, whatever the reason may be, in your total heat drops as well. So your, your SHR changes from 0.7 from 0.8 to 0.7. So, so what happens in the real world, okay? You're in the space, 3,200 CFM is coming in at 49 degrees. It's sunny out, it's hot, it's fully loaded. Everybody's fine. What happens on the day when it's cooler outside, it's cloudy, there's not as many people in there and it's still providing 49 degrees. Well, you're gonna overcool the space, right? So what are the options if it's a constant volume system? You can turn the unit off, which doesn't dehumidify very well. You can change the CFM if you have the ability to. If it's a constant volume unit, the only other thing you could do is change the supplier temperature. So in our example here, we're using a chill water coil with a modulating valve, three-way valve or whatever. We're gonna change the leaving air temperature so we don't overcool the space at part low condition. How do we know what temperature to provide? Well, we go back to our sensible heat equation. There is our sensible heat equation solving for supplier dry bulb. So what does a supplier have to be at this 0.7 SHR to achieve, you know, to not overcool the space, let's say it that way. So the supplier is, if you solve for this equation, it's 58.4. Now, if we take that and put it in here, we plot it here, 58.4, and we go up to the saturation line, it gets us right here, okay? So now where is that gonna end up in our space? That temperature is entering, the air is entering the space at that temperature in that condition, where is the space gonna be at? So we use our sensible heat ratio to determine that. So if we draw the SHR of 0.7, again, I'm drawing it through the index point, which is right here, just to get the slope and it's 0.7 here. Now we move this SHR up to our condition here and the resulting A prime is where we will end up in our space. Okay, so that right there, if you take anything away from this today, 
go back and watch this. That is the fundamental thing we see um, that's not captured very well in the HVAC community. It causes so many problems at part load, okay? Constant volume systems, modulating chill water valve, not really fully understanding what happens at part load. So you see it, what's the problem at A prime? Well, we're okay with our space temperature. We're 72 degrees, but look at our real relative humidity. Now it's at 70% RH, which is at about oh, 60, you know, something dew point. Is that a problem or not? Maybe not in most applications. If it's a pharmaceutical job where you got to maintain specific tight tolerances, it could be a major, major problem. So anyway, just pay attention to that. Extremely important. And we talk about that a lot in, in part three. So we talked about air mixing, sensible heat ratio, calculating air quantity, tons of refrigeration, a little teaser for the full load and part load. Are we done with this yet? No, there's more, but wait, there's more. Okay. So part three, we really drive home controlling temperature and humidity over all load conditions, which again is the is the way we see um, most of us, I say us, getting in trouble. And a lot of what I've learned on psychometrics is having jobs where, you know, I'd go out to the job and it just wasn't controlling temperature, humidity, and I take out my psych chart and I truly try to understand what's going on and uh, help me in my career be a better, you know, account executive. And it's helped me um, take care of my clients better. So I stress to please, you know, if you're not familiar with those things, I'll get familiar with it. Okay. So thank you. Please email me. Um, for PDH credits, please like this video before you leave. And I'm going to see if there's any questions here. I think I saw one question, Heather. Was that right? Or are we good on questions? There was a question about, uh, can you rewatch this video on YouTube? Yes. The QR code is in the top left. Um, this one and part one and all the other podcasts. Um, and I think every the other questions were people discussing or chatting back and forth about um, about the about the, when you were working on the ton, on the tonnage. Got it. All right. Well, again, I, I just want to say thank you all so much for watching this. We're going to, um, you know, I'll play this uh, little recording here and leave these, um, let's see, QR codes. Yeah. So if you want to connect with us, here's how to do it. There's a couple QR codes here. And again, thank you so much for watching us. Really do enjoy these live shows and thank you so much. And uh, we hope to see you at the next one. So, and thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Thanks, you. Thank you. It was great. See you in a minute.